All right, so we've been, as I stated earlier, we've been working through the Bible, and uh, I've been kind of going through some pieces, trying to hit on some of the big aspects of Scripture, knowing that I can't certainly cover everything as, as I preach through this in the way that I have chosen to do so in 2021. But we turn now to the book of Judges, chapter 2, is where we're going to spend a good chunk of our time this morning. So many years ago, I watched a friend's hamster named Hammy, and he was in his little cage. Now he had a warm nest of cedar shavings to curl up in, he had a water bottle to drink from, and best of all, he had a wheel he could run inside of. He had everything a hamster could ever need or want, but for some reason, Hammy refused to run inside his running wheel. Instead, he came up with a better idea. He climbed onto the top of the wheel, turned over on his back, and stretched out. Gradually, the wheel started to turn, and Hammy's entire body rolled with it head first. The wheel picked up speed faster and faster and faster until clunk. He smacked his head on the bottom of the cage. He got up, shook himself off, apparently hurt from this unexpected sharp blow to his head. But what did Hammy do next? He climbed back on top of the wheel, turned over on his back, stretched himself out, and got ready to clunk his head again. Why? Why would a hamster do something to hurt themselves disregarding the proper use of what they had, even though they had everything that he needed right in his cage. And why would he do it again, a second time? But the bigger question might be, why do humans, who are supposedly smarter than hamsters, sometimes do the very same thing? My sermon in a sentence this week is this, which is my, again, as I've said each and every week that I have been here, that this is to be my summary statement for the message. That if you go out or when you go out this week and someone asks you about what was talked about in church, or you want to be able to say, this is really what we hit on this week in the book of Judges, this is a great thing to remember. It's that the pattern of sin in the lives of humanity throughout all of history, is clearly revealed in the book of Judges. Sin, servitude, sorrow, and salvation. Now, the period that we find in the book of Judges is called the time after the conquest. During the time of Joshua, previously, the nation, for the most part, had remained faithful to God. They were told to utterly destroy the nations from the land. They didn't always do that. And as a result, those nations were left to be in there uh, for the future time. They didn't destroy all of the heathen nations that were there as God commanded. In verses 3 and 4 of Judges chapter 2, we read this. When Joshua had let the people go... The children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. But they angered the Lord by the failure to do what he had commanded. As I already stated, they did not drive out all of their enemy. And so we are told, God tells them that they would now become a snare in their future, that it would be a test for his people. Later on in Judges, we see what happened as a result of this failure to do all that God commanded them. In the end, it shows us just how far they fell into sin. Judges chapter 21, just skip ahead for just a minute. 
If there's one sentence that defines this book or that's in there very often, it's this. Every man that did what was every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Throughout the book of Judges, we see this cycle play out over and over and over again. These four stages, which we'll hit on more later. First, sin. In here, God, uh, Israel chose idolatry. The servitude stage. That as a result of this idolatry, they are turned over to a place of servitude. They are enslaved or made to suffer. And then after that, they suffer. Or they sorrow, excuse me. They sorrow and they begin to cry out in repentance. And then lastly, salvation. They were sent a judge. So God, in his mercies, I think about what Betsy just mentioned moments ago, God, in his mercy, sends a judge that helps them be restored to repentance. And a time of rest and peace would follow. Now, at the beginning of chapter 2, we read that Israel was in a state of sin. They had fallen into sin because of their unwillingness to listen to God and drive out these other inhabitants. Now, their disobedience led to problems that have played out ever since. God said, I will never break covenant with you, and you shall make, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of, of the land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is it that you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become a thorn in your sides and their gods shall be a snare to you. Now, let's rewind quite a ways here, back to what would have been basically our reading from week two of this year, Genesis chapter 17, where God made a covenant with Israel, an everlasting covenant, which is the kind of covenant that God makes. Verse, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant between you and your offspring and, you, and throughout the generations everlasting to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as you... As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring, after you throughout their generations. Now, right towards the end of the book of Joshua, we read that God fulfilled his promise. So let's read that a second. We love to hear when God, uh, we love to hear the outpourings, the results of what God has promised. So in, Gen in Joshua chapter 21, we read, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to their fathers. He tells them, I'm going to give you this land, it's yours, and he does it. He gives them the land, they took possession of it, and they settled there. God fulfilled his promise. It was completely fulfilled, the covenant that he made with Abraham. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we read that God warned his people of the danger of influence. He said, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, Seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them to you, and you defeat them, then you must devote yourself to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. And they would, For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. Now, I'm going to just take a little small journey to the side of kind of where I'm going today, but to touch an issue that's really 
uh, impacted our society and our world quite drastically um, in the recent times. Now, I've heard several people, not here, but in my, the course of my travelings over the last several years, that look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, and they seek to use that to justify homosexual marriage. Now, you might say, well, how is this? There's nothing in there about this. But this is the reason and the rationale they've used. They say, God, so verse 3 says, God didn't allow, or this is what they say, I should say, God didn't allow interracial marriage. And now it's normal, right? We now look at interracial marriage as this normal thing. So in their mind, they justify it by saying it is a cultural issue, not a moral issue. So in that line of thinking, they say, well, then this is no different. This is simply a cultural shift. So that's, it's fine. It's okay. No big deal, right? But they miss, when they think this way, they fail to miss the reason that God condemned interracial marriage at the time. As so often happens, they stop reading too early. At the beginning of verse 4, in that passage, we read the word for, F-O-R. Okay? And so when I see that word, that tells me there's a connection. You can't take verse 3 without verse 4. You can't take verse 4 without verse 3. That is a connecting word. The word for here is a bridge that tells us what came after needs to be considered. So it says this in verse 4. For they will turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. This was not a racial issue. It was a kingdom issue. Remember, we've talked about this before, that the nations that were around them, the nations, these people that were in their land at that time, all worshipped Many idols, many gods. You know, we, we, and you've probably heard the worst of it. Child sacrifice, all of these things were taking place. And so when God says, these people need to go, he understood it from a kingdom issue. He knew that, their, that his people, because of the power of sin, the flesh, they would be dragged into that lifestyle. That sin that resides around us needs to be put to death. Because if we let it linger, it's going to infiltrate us. Now, we are seeing many churches in this country choose cultural practices over the authority of Scripture. <clears throat> We need to ask ourselves, what is it that drives our life? Who are we serving? Are we serving the cultural norms of our society, or are we serving the authority of Scripture? The verse that just came to my mind through the Spirit was that, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's vital that our practices and our principles are grounded in the Word of God. So moving back to where I want to focus most of my time, what caused the Israelites' sin? So we move further down in Judges chapter 2 to verses 11 through 13, and we read, All that, the gener all that generation, Joshua's generation, was gathered to their fathers. Okay, that means they all died. And there arose another generation. Okay, here's another key phrase in the book of Judges. There arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Israel became unfaithful to God. And the people in Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtaroth. Exactly what God said would happen. Now the text there again says they knew not God. The second generation failed to develop their parents' faith as their own. Like it still is today, people are quick to forget and neglect the faith of their forefathers, even from one generation prior. The irony of Israel's situation here is that the nation had just left, not that long before, bondage. They'd been given freedom out of Egypt. And yet, within that two generations later, they returned to idolatry. They returned to slavery, to spiritual bondage of their own volition. And so as a result of their sin, they returned themselves to a place of servitude. Judges chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. God had warned them what would happen if they broke his covenant. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses, verse 24, it says, The Lord is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is hot in his anger toward the nation of Israel. God delivered them and sold them into the hand of their enemy. The hand of the Lord was against them for evil. What was going on was the direct opposite of the promise given to those who are faithful in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The result of this evil was harm and calamity. Now maybe you're thinking, how could a loving God operate in a way that seems so unloving to me? I hear that question all the time. And I think about Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, where we read, For my thoughts, this is God speaking, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We often think we know what is best. We as humans are quick to make decisions about what we see or what we believe is wise. How many of the decisions that we make are snap judgments? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. We need to understand that we view things through our lens, the lens of a finite, short-sighted human being. It's natural when things happen in life, when things that don't go the way that's comfortable for us. We wish things would go a different way. To question, God, where are you? To want to say, God, why would you do this to me? Or why would you allow this? As though we have some authority, that we somehow believe that we know better what it is that we need. And I find it very intriguing that in the book of Job, Job has that very question. Now, if you don't know much about Job, and you're complaining about what's going on in your life, you might want to visit with the book of Job. Here's a guy who dealt with everything. And he does get to a place, he's found to be faithful, he does get to a place where he asks God that question. God, why, why is this happening? But it's interesting how God answers him. And it isn't the feel-good, real comfy, cozy kind of answer that we want. But he says this, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? 
We want an answer that says, God, just fix the problem. Make things better for me. But we don't often see the fallout that can come by the decisions we believe to be wise. Maybe you're asking yourself about that last verse I read, about God being jealous. You know, isn't jealousy a sin? Maybe you even, maybe when you talk to people about this verse, if you have, you, you maybe even think, man, this feels, this feels strange to be talking about jealousy in a positive way. It just seems wrong. You know, I, I think about jealousy that shows up in our household all the time with our kids. So how can a good God, a God who we say is free from sin, be described as jealous? But here there's a huge difference between understanding what this place of sinful jealousy, that which man possesses oftentimes, and we are required or called to repent from that. But there's also God's jealousy, which is righteous and pure. Usually, most of the time, our jealousy that shows up in us is rooted in sin. But God has a right to desire our attention, our praise, our hearts. And thus, he is right to jealously long for us. This doesn't mean that he needs us, necessarily, or that, that, he, uh, that he somehow is sinful in, in his desire, but he so desires us. We were his creation designed to be in a relationship with him. And he is jealous. He doesn't want to let any of us perish. That should give us hope. He wants to see us that none would be, uh, none would perish without finding him. He created the world. We want to set up our own rules. We want to set the standards to what we want. But God created the world, and He's justly jealous. For our righteous or for our worship and praise. Now, because Israelites' worship was divided, they were split up, focusing on different things. As we said, they were in bondage. As is true in our states too, we find ourselves in a place of servitude. You, you worship, you, you serve something in the world, and eventually, hopefully, God willing, you realize, man, I'm in servitude to something, and I need to get out. This is not. Helpful. This is not life giving. And so the natural place to turn is sorrow or supplication. And so in that case where we, we realize, man, I need to repent of those things that, we, that I've done or those things that I've said. In this time of the judges, he raised up leaders that could then help him, help them return back to God. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, we read where God says, Return to the Lord your God and your children and obey his voice in all that I command you today. With all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. In their sorrow, oftentimes in our sorrow, we find one place where we can go. And that's God. Oppression, persecution, often has the effects of driving people to their knees. Physically, we read in this case with the Israelites, the nation would be humbled by oppression. And we read through that the rest of the Old Testament in particular. But more importantly, they were pushed to their knees or brought to their knees spiritually. And then finally, that last stage of the cycle is that they were brought to salvation. In Judges chapter 2, we read, The Lord raised the judges. They didn't select their own leaders. God raised them up, and they saved them out of the hands of the ones who plundered them. Whenever the Lord raised judges up, the, judge, the Lord was with the judge. And he saved them from the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. 
God had promised that he would turn them back. They would, that he, would, he would give them blessing if they would turn back to him. He raised up these judges. Now a judge, by definition, I looked up the definition, is a vindicator and a deliverer. Judges were raised by special appointment by a Lord to deliver Israel from and avenge from their adversaries. Now, as long as that judge lived, peace would last, as long as they remained faithful. But once the judge died, the people would begin to stray. Sounds a little bit like, man, when, you know, when you have a place and you have a leader and the leader leaves, and there's this, what do we do now? Kind of brings me back to my message here about needing to have lines and re be replaceable as leaders. That as we progress, uh, that we understand that God is, uh, is seeking leaders who will follow him. Then this, this cycle played out over and over and over again. And I agree, Betsy, it's painful to, to read through that and think, why don't you get it? And yet, we're in the same exact boat. We find that they did not drop from them their stubborn practices. So out of this, we see a sad reality that has played itself over time and time again, even to this day. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 17, again, we read the phrase, A generation grew up not knowing God. They refused to follow God's commandments. Proverbs 14, verse 34, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Psalm 33, verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. For over 400 years, this cycle repeated itself over and over and over again for the Israelites. Leading them into places that we, you know, that you will, if you haven't read about them before, they're coming. As we read through more of the Old Testament, some of these uh, places they never would have wanted to go. And how much is that like our sin? The cycles of our lives that we think, man, I will never go there. And before long, you sin and then you realize, man, I've been, I'm living there now. And I'm comfortable in that spot. Until God gives me something that will cause discomfort and drive me back to him. So let's take away a few lessons here before I finish up. These are from the judges, although some of these texts, I've got some additional texts in here, but things that you can reference later. But first, God means what he says. Secondly, and we're seeing this here in the West. Right now, we are never more than one generation away from apostasy. We are to teach the generations that follow us. We are to instill God in their hearts. Now, I've had two people just in this last week that have expressed, two totally different unrelated people expressed to me the same sentiment. They said, Aaron, we're losing our children. They didn't have kids. We're losing our children because of what our culture is doing to them, what's happening in our homes. What's our responsibility? It's not to give up on them. It's not to say, well, I can't relate to these people because they're, you know, they, they believe this, this, and this, and they've, been, they, they've got these teachings going on. And no, it's, we need to love them, and we are called to teach them who the Lord is and what he has done. Number three, if we forsake God, his hand will be turned against us. Number four, when we forsake God, we become slaves to sin. Number five, God's, godly sorrow is what is required to lead to repentance. Feeling sorry about what you did or didn't do in and of itself is not enough. God doesn't, want, does, God doesn't want your sorrow. He wants your repentance. Sorrow is necessary, though, for us to be driven to repentance. 
Number six, only when we are humbled will we have mercy. We learn that God is willing to forgive. He did that over and over and over. And that's the hope that we find in here. And then lastly, all the judges who redeemed Israel were just a foretaste of the redemption that would come through Jesus. He would come. He did come. We're going to celebrate that here in two weeks. But we should be celebrating it all the time. He came to deliver us from the oppression of sin. He is the great judge. The cycle that we see in the, judge, in the book of Judges doesn't have to be repeated in our lives. When we choose to serve the flesh, we re repeat that cycle. But you don't have to remain caught up in the cycle of sin, servitude, sorrow, and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, you can break the cycle. So if you've been struggling with sin, or you've been freed from bondage like Israel, but you've gone back into bondage, you've felt like you've overcome a sin and now you've found yourself back in that sin, you can repent and ask for forgiveness. If Jesus knows you and you're in living a sinful life at this point in time, you can confess your sins and he will forgive you. But if you are still stuck in bondage, and let me just get through this, cut through this so there's no, no loss of words in the analogy. If Jesus doesn't know you, if you are not known by God, and you've never been freed from this bondage of sin, you need to hear the word that Jesus came 2,000 years ago and died for you and for me. He came to take away the guilt and shame of any sin that you have done. He tells us that we are to, to confess his name. We are to repent of the sins in our lives. To be baptized as a symbol to represent that we are washed away, or we are having our sins washed away. And that God is offering us peace and salvation in the name of the Lord. So if you're in that place today and you're thinking, you know what? I'm not ready yet. I'm too comfortable in the life that I have. You know, maybe I like hearing a little bit about what God is or who he is. And I like some of his traits, but there's other pieces that I really struggle with and I'm not ready to give them over, I'm going to just remind you of one other verse. And it's this. Today is the day of your salvation. Give your life to him today. If you're in this place, and that's something that you feel convicted of, come talk to me after the service. I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you more about who Jesus has been in my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as I said about 30 minutes ago, Lord, I, I know that too often we, we choose to live our lives based on what we see as right in our own eyes. So, Lord, when we do that, I pray that you would uh, cast those things from our presence. Lord, help us to not be deceived by the lies of this world. Help us to know that we are called to, uh, to faithfully seek and honor you. Lord, that you are a jealous God, that you jealously long for us um, to be who you've created us to be. Just as we can at times maybe jealously long for our family, for our friends to know you, Lord, we pray that that, that be true, Lord, that we want nothing more than for them to know you. And so there's, there's a sense of, of right in there. That we can want that so badly that what we want to do is to serve you, to make your name known. Lord, as we sit up here, church on a hill, Lord, help us to be a beacon of light and of hope for those in Grove City and Litchfield and Wilmer and Atwater and Cosmos and Painesville and all these areas that surround us. Lord, we want to serve you. We want to be faithful. We want to be found uh, 
um, serving you on that day when you return, so that you may say to us individually and collectively, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, teach us to lean on you. Teach us to walk in your steps. And Lord, when there are times where we are feeling unable to move, Lord, which is really all the time, Lord, we need you, we are incapable, but help, help carry us through the difficult times in life. Help us to keep a, a focus on you. Keep our gaze fixed on you. Help us to learn that which you are trying to teach us wherever we are in this journey called life. I pray your blessing on uh, each person that is with us this morning as well as those who are not. Uh, Lord, just be, be, be made clear to them. Lord, help them to see you and uh, to live, to be doers of your word, not just hearers. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the closing benediction if you are able. May the peace and grace of Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen. You are sent.